Very welcome everybody. I'm really sorry that we had uh, a delay. I have an echo myself, so I have to uh, close the stream. There we go, that's all set. So, without further ado, let's switch to uh, the other thing. Dun, 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 dun. Remove the title, picture, and making. <laughs> so, let's resize the camera. Ah, that doesn't work. This is what I wanted. So, let's go. Uh, about me, I have quite some experience by now. Um, I've started uh, a professional IT uh, 14 years ago, which is, when you think about it, um, before uh, the crash of, of 2007, 2008. So, yeah, that's a really long time ago. Since then, I gained a bachelor's degree in computer science. And, um, yeah, I've been using Rust since 2016. Uh, I got into that with uh, the Core Dump hackerspace, which I'm still with today. And since 2017, uh, we quickly get up here. I'm with Rustfest. As you can see here, this is the first shirt uh, I owned as a as a host. Why is this not okay? So table of contents. What are we looking at tonight? So the topic is how to build multiplayer systems and multiplayer games are um, complicated because you have timing restraints and you have people that don't like it when uh, your software randomly crashes so um, to meet this goal this top goal to play the, the game with the, with friends we need a server we need infrastructure and we need a client and uh, I've written down what uh, what we need like the, in this order from goal to implementations and in the end we'll have some conclusions and um, Oh, by the way, if you're bored for any reason, I have the chat open, as you can see. Uh, you can just say so, and then I will happily hand out the um, the URL to the current demo. So you can actually play the game right now if you choose to, to do so. Uh, no, yes. This is way less stressful than I imagined. All right, so, um, sounds like a lot. Um, oh, by the way, if, if you have any questions, just type it into the chat. I will be happy to respond to that. Um, so what, what, we, what do we need? We actually need to like have it all into, like in, in our head, right? We need to have a mental picture. There's a button on the stream page. I'm not sure. Oh, maybe. So anyway, here is. Uh, sorry for the typing. Here's the game URL. Uh, so we would like to see everything, right? We need to have a mental picture of what we are going to do and how complicated can that be? Well, um, we need server infrastructure and server configuration and game server and actually let's look at this picture real quick uh, I don't know, schema pick so this picture is what happens in one round just one round like from oh I don't know um, because from, from like it starts from the top let's see if I can uh, Add this picture in the background. No, no matter. Okay, so let's start from the top. We start in the timer section. 
so the timer ticks it's it's like a clock every second it um, it it fires a, a tick event tick event is a normal rust data structure it's uh, derived from actx message so this one gets sent to the arena which is the uh, 3 by 6 grid the arena then creates a decision collector and a next step collector so we need two collectors and uh, we're going to see why because all the messages in this part of the system are completely async so they're fire and forget um, we don't have a way to reasonably await stuff currently in, in pure actx because all the functions are synchronous and we could return uh, a fe uh, future that we build ourselves, but uh, I have noticed that the amount of code necessary to do all that is so much more that I have to write at least three times the code and all the and dense and dense and dense. So it's for me way easier to just write down all the messages in this picture and then just fire them and think about okay how can I collect them so let's let's follow one tick so the timer goes off the arena creates the decision collector and the next step collector so these are like the little silo box and the arrow in roughly the middle both of them get, get sent to the snakes all of the snakes that are in the game currently and each snake ha may have um, players attached so then the snake goes to the player the block pluck yeah the wall pluck and the player is represented on the server by the websocket actor which is also a normal rust data structure i designed the, the system like this because i originally had feared that if someone spams the websocket then it will trigger a flood of messages and I didn't want that. So what happens when you press a button in the game, it just reaches your actor and that actor stores your vote or your action until the timer and the tick and everything passes through and then collects this information from the actor. So the amount of processing needed and the amount of communication needed after the user clicks once is very limited. And that makes the uh, system super efficient. All right. So the WebSocket now has the decision collector. I drew it again. It's the little uh, tube on the left. So it's the same object. It has been moved. Um, it collects from all the WebSockets. After it reaches that, it has a decide function. And the decide function, we can follow this huge arrow on the bottom. Uh, this one will... Uh, go to the will have a collected direction so all um, web sockets connected to that snake have decided so we have a vote we know now uh, does the majority of the players of that snake want to go left or right or straight ahead that de decision is then collected into the arrow into the next step collector and this collector you can guess it collects all the decisions from all the snakes. So now we have all the information that we need for the calculation and then you can see this little uh, rounded arrow on the top right. It, if this one, the, if the next step collector decides it's finished, then it will feed it back into the arena and the arena is now able to have without any synchronization from our part just with messages sent it can now say okay this is what will happen in the next step um, I noticed that if a player disconnects during that the whole system stalls but uh, this was not the problem because I could add timeouts to all of these so we have little more timers on these little collectors and these timers depend on the speed of the main timer. So I say, uh, if I think it is 10% or 50% of the time has passed, we'll just ignore all the remaining answers and decide. So the other players still have a decent 
information. I see there are some jokes in the chat about, uh, I assume, the upcoming elections in some countries. So, <laughs> yeah. Moving on. That's me. That's the slides. Where is me at the slides? Here we are. Okay. So, let's make that whole thing a reality. So, I need a server. And uh, I would like to have a server that I set up and it's good to go. So I chose uh, Data Center Lite, which is uh, a provider um, residing in Switzerland. They have this cool concept that they run out of an old industrial building that's actually water powered and solar powered. So this is a CO2 neutral server. DNS. I run myself, currently not on that infrastructure, but we're getting there one step at a time. Oh, it doesn't work. And now it works. So configuration. Everybody has to do some configuration. And if you have lots of little projects, then you notice at some point you have mostly the same because you have your style, but sometimes you have these little differences and it's really annoying. So, um, yeah, pre pretty uh, annoying if you forget these little details. So I put it into Ansible. Ansible is a configuration tool uh, that does not require an agent on the system. It's just over SSH. So my laptop has a folder that I check into Git, and then it goes out to all my servers, configures them with Nginx, uh, let's encrypt in this case, uh, sometimes uh, not DNS. Uh, OpenSSH is also configured. So for instance, I disable password logins and stuff like that. So if this machine ever goes down or I say, mm, I have this one service, maybe the snake service wasn't um, like as efficient as I imagined, I have to move that to another system. I can do that with relative ease because if I configure that with Ansible, all my deployment keys are also in Ansible. So if I change the role from one system to another, these keys will follow and, and just be there. And then I can deploy this from my laptop or from continuous integration or whatever, um, creating Unix accounts and systemd and whatnot. Um, yes, by the way, uh, the server has not crashed since I uh, started it, like ever. But if it did, systemd would restart it within one millisecond so users would experience a reconnect but the service should always be around so that's pretty cool uh, i have this is like a little bit cropped off because i uh, create everything with ansible i create this proxy url txt this is not a standard it's just my idea but what this does is configures nginx and this file that's residing inside the Unix account for, for each service onto the same path, right? So Nginx needs to know where the reverse proxy will be because Nginx handles the encryption and all the certificates. And my uh, service needs to know which port to bind. So I output this proxy URL into the user and then on startup, I can just read it out. Uh, it's nothing fancy. Let me quickly show this to you. So this is our main function. And dum, 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 dum. cannot zoom. Why can I not zoom? So this function you full screen. Nah, doesn't work. I hope you can read it. So this function extract bind is basically um, we read the string backend URL txt and then uh, trim it, drop off the HTTP, drop off the last slash, and then we get an address out that uh, any normal tool can parse, including actx. So proc bind adder is a string, and we can then use that directly into the HTTP server of bind. I'm really sorry, if someone knows how to zoom in, I would love to do that. Can I do that? Oh, okay. 
appearance zoom in where's our thing now oh here here we go again control plus sadly oh now it works perfect so all right this is all we need what this will return is a string that's uh, in my case bra opening bracket colon colon one closing bracket colon and then some random integer that support number command plus I don't have a command but I have to reconfigure my uh, keyboard to emit the, the little plus from the side anyhow let's continue uh, we have talked about this picture so core logic so I explained how we, we reach all this data how we just collect all the information and now here we are in the arena uh, at the back of the, the circle Let me show you. so we're back here in the middle of this circle and now we get this collected snake bodies message and now we have to do the steps and the steps are relatively easy we just say okay um, we figure out because the messages may be reordered right right we don't know which snake is the fastest maybe uh, one of the the snakes for for some reason has hundred players and the other one has just one the one with one player is most likely faster than the one with hundred so they might arrive out of order so we have to look up all the snakes here first so they are in the same order as they are stored in our uh, arena actor uh, then we also have to take care of wrapping around so you're if you, I don't know if you're playing right now but you can go out the top and then you will enter from the bottom again same on the sides and that is done here um, this is way easier because then uh, the snakes don't have to know how big the arena is right the arena will then just tell the snake hey did you know that your head is now no longer outside the arena like my finger is but it's back here it's back here again all right <laughs> uh, Flucky says the mobile version is a bit broken apparently is hot fixing it so if your uh, stream is working for you don't reload the page just stick with us moving on uh, there is also the case that uh, a snake body may, may be maybe empty um, this used to be true uh, because when I create a snake uh, the body that is stored in the arena is empty um, this is actually old code but um, yeah to be safe I never want this to panic I left it in because after this I do an access and I can't remember why but for some reason I was too lazy oh yeah that's why I, I considered switching that to an iflet but iflet would then have required me to do this comparison that we have here on the right where the next fruit is to have, to have that inside another if so this is just lazy me saying I want to have this in one if instead of two so ta-da that's the whole thing um, we have to do some bookkeeping for uh, the trashes so we truncate the length of uh, the bodies here as well and then uh, we just save uh, whatever it is so this function decides whether the, the fruit has to be reset because it has been eaten and this uh, part is if it has not been eaten then we have to move so we extend the snake by one and then if it hasn't eaten anything we have to crop it by one and that's how the thing moves this is atomic to the user it's just in one step all right 
I can do an iflet on a tuple. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, before we lose ourselves in this, um, can you write me uh, a merge request? The code is on GitLab. Uh, on uh, GitLab, DNS2, define multi, multi player snake. Pasting the code in here. I would be very happy if you did uh, send me a merge request before the end of the talk. CI is enabled, I think. So, uh, no reason to. Uh, let's check it quick. Yes, CI is enabled. So, if you open a merge request, it should be checked as well. Okay, so now we have our step. Um, the other part of the core logic is detecting collisions. And I went through some iterations with that and I got stuck. Uh, but um, luckily, I could ask some friends and uh, they said, hey, why aren't you um, using indexes, right? The snakes are in order anyway. Just like make indexes. I was like, yeah, actually that's true. That's way better than having two mutable iterators fighting over who's more right and who owns the data more than the other one. So um, let's go through it. There's still room for optimizations uh, because here um, I'm using a hash map. For those that come from uh, Python, for instance, you probably remember uh, default dict. Well, let me just move myself out of the way. So someone was kind enough to write the same thing with uh, Rust. It's called default hash map. It's just a hash map that uh, uses this closure or um, if any other function. So whenever I access a thing that doesn't exist, we'll just create a vector with uh, capacity of snakes. One second. Oh, I see there are some people against the Debian or system D. Well, um, I had great experience with Debian, especially because I can set up a server, let it run for two years and then update it and it hasn't been hacked and it still works. So yeah, pretty fine with systemd, except for uh, systemd resolve to you, if I may say so, which is uh, tragic. Moving on. So here we are. Um, most of you know four. You know four in is uh, syntactic sugar for uh, using iterators underneath. So we can still do that. We can still say, let's iterate. And why would you do that? Because of this enumerate. Enumerate uh, shows us the index. This may not true for all data structures, but it's true for vectors. So we, in vectors, we always have this index and enumerate just shows us that. There are other iterators which don't have uh, this index variable, like if we have some sort of linked list or, or anything that's like not linear uh, container. Anyhow, we don't have to care, right? That's the great thing about Rust. We just say iterate and enumerate, and there we go. So now we can um, search our body so we have the snake. This is the current snake we're looking at. The snake has a body. Body is a structure that has the actual body, which is this field. Also the heading and, and uh, some other metadata. We iterate over the, the body and say, OK, let's flag all the fields that this snake occupies. So we populate that. And after we have done that for every snake, we have all the fields that are occupied by all the snakes. This means if one field is occupied by more than one snake, we have a collision. This also means if a snake uh, occupies a field twice, it has a collision with itself and we're done. We have this one field and we have to check it. So let's check it. We have the actions 
what that we want to take. So we have all the crashed snakes down here. And this is just a vector. Initialized with, we could also use default dict, which I did, to be honest, in the beginning. But then I realized, hey, I know how many snakes there are, right? It's just how many snakes there are. But I'm, so I can initialize this structure with false, assuming no one has crashed. And then we'll just look at the heads of all the snakes, because that's the only thing that moves, right? It's the head of all the snakes. So we extract the head from each snake and then look up in our uh, occupancy field. Do we have more than one occupancy in this field? It could be either with itself or with someone else or with multiple others, doesn't matter. If it's more than one, then we can mark all the snakes that occupy this field as crashed. Uh, I could optimize that probably a bit more. So I don't, if I realize that all the snakes have crashed that I don't look into the other fields, but let's be honest, this is so little code. And I've noticed that if there are more than like four or five snakes in the game, it's already almost unplayable. So this is fine. Don't over optimize things. Now we have checked where are the collisions. Now we walk through all the snakes again. But this time we just look at who has collided. Why this way around? Why not the other way around? Well, um, because then I can just say snake dot address send reset. And the reset is the command for the snake. Hey, you've died. I'm sorry. Go tell all your clients that you have died. And that's what uh, the responsibility of the snake is. And so the snake goes on doing that. But we don't have to care. So we, if we add uh, some fancy features later in the future, where we say, hey, if the snake dies, maybe add fireworks or whatever. This logic has no need for change. We don't need to update anything in here. We just say do send reset at and the reset at structure is known to be uh, used only for um, snakes that have died. Okay, almost done with the core logic. We broadcast all the snake bodies, which l basically looks like this. Um, just like buffer all the, the bodies into a structure, send all the messages out to all the uh, clients. We don't need to involve the snakes for that process because we all know all the clients in the arena as well. So we just send them directly. Here's the update. And if the fruit has changed, we get uh, a new position. We cannot, I also added a feature where I say, um, don't use the old position, just anything but the old, the old position. And then we broadcast the arena. Uh, funny side note, I also use broadcast arena if I resize the arena and that we will see afterwards in the demo. Alrighty. Um, so, game client. What do we need for the game client? Well, we need all the rendering, and we need user input, and we need server input, and we don't want the people to install much, so it's a website, of course. Naturally, it's JavaScript. Um, so yeah, these are the three types of events, user input, buttons, key presses, um, clicks, and uh, the server inputs is all the messages, they come over network, and then of course connection established lost. Uh, that's really handy. Currently it's still a bit in development mode because uh, if I lose the connection, there is a retry. And as soon as uh, the client is able to connect again, it will throw away the cache and reload the whole thing, which is really great because when I implemented the CSS changes for uh, Rustfest, then um, suddenly it popped up with the correct colors all the time. People did not have to do anything at all. So that's great. So how do we do that? How do we keep the same infrastructure that we have on the server also on the client? Well, for starters, we can um, just route the messages. So when, whenever we get the message in, we say, okay, this is update field info or update snakes. Who does uh, need to know 
about this. So we have the renderer that needs to know about these two and we need uh, the buttons to know about these. So the, the player knows, oh, okay, from my decision to go right, now it's back to center. If I don't decide, it will go center, which is true for now, but may change in the near future. Same with player count. Uh, this is so easy, I decided to not make a module, it's just like update one string. Um, controller color, a feature that I added late, like really late, um, it's just a message, it updates one color, but it also needs to say to the renderer, hey, did you know that the player is now controlling a different snake? So you should mark the different snake with a triangle instead of a circle like all the others. Oh yeah, um, I'm really bad with graphics, so all the artistic stuff is basic shapes. Lines, squares, circles, triangles. Where? Can't we do anything? Uh, same with ping features, and of course, a default case erroring the whole thing. And a catch all, because it's JavaScript. If it uh, throws an exception in the wrong moment, the update doesn't work anymore, and that would be sad. People will be sad. So, don't want that. We rather log it and uh, maybe implement some uh, remote logging in the future than having. Um, old clients crash because of HTTP caches. Moving on, this is the UI. This is all of it. So we use a flexbox. Um, this is a little bit misaligned, I'm sorry. Uh, it features a canvas and some buttons. And down here we have the current stats. That's it. We don't need more. Uh, David asks, is it being recorded? Yes, and if we're lucky, I haven't tested it, then it will be recorded in very good quality, whatever that is. So, all this effort, why not just use Node.js and hack the thing together and be done with it in a day? Why take so much time? Well, you can see the load here, it's zero, and it's 0.1 because I logged in and started top. So this is all the processes that belong to that user. And that's it. There's there's basically no load. Uh, if there are lots of people, I stress tested it once, the load went up to 0.4. So if you want, we can uh, stress test it today. I have the shell open here. And it's still zero. Apparently some people are playing now because the, oops, pardon me, let me quickly zoom in here. So now you have the, the live version. So we have a load of zero and the CPU usage was 0.3. So, uh, yeah, there's, this is one part, right? This is the, the uh, we don't use energy, it's fast, we have super response times. But um, if someone in the chat wants to guess, what else do we get from, from Rust? I know there's some delay, I have to wait, so we'll drink. Mm, no guesses, or maybe the stream has crashed, I don't know. So the other thing I, I was going for is it, it gets quite productive. So adding new features like, um, let's say the timeout features for when clients disconnect or uh, implementing ping. If you have the page open right now, um, you can see here on the side, let me zoom in. We have a ping feature. This ping feature is simply another actor that will go in regular intervals. I think it's every five or two or five seconds and ping the client. There's a ping protocol implemented uh, with the browsers and it will measure this delay. So I'm pretty good I'm with eight milliseconds. I have asked people in Japan, they were around 250, uh, some in Canada also 200 to 300. 
So, very playable. The worst I have measured myself was uh, over VPN, over 4G. And that was still with 300 milliseconds well okay to play within. The pink feature also has a little uh, threshold in. It's half the timer cycle. So if you re uh, pass 500 milliseconds ping, which means round trip 500 milliseconds, then it will issue a warning and will make this text red and say, hey, uh, your connection is bad. Just so you know, maybe maybe it will crash. <laughs> or, or maybe your votes will arrive so late that you uh, see very confusing results. Okay, um, I see some people are playing. Let me show you the... There's another feature. Oops. That does not work as I intended. So I told you about the admin. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, sorry, real quick. I have to. Uh, There's some secret data here. Mostly it is the um, the session key for the cookies and all the admin. So, oops. Well, key is pretty long. All right, so we have 10 players, me included, which means if I resize this or add more snakes, you should get an instant response. So now, uh, there's a little not so nice feature. You have to reload the page right now to be able to control the other snake. So if you want to control the other snake, like just reload the page and then your color will change. And Ooh. <laughs> all right, moving on. I uh, hope you enjoy this very much. So, uh, the admin interface, this one we can use uh, the Actix feature. So we can use async functions and this is great. It, it's so fast and it doesn't require you to have this huge manually constructed async stuff. So first, admin requires a login. Login page uh, is similar to this. And then we go to the arena. The arena is a normal actor. Everything in Actix is mostly a normal actor. So we send it a message. We say get arena config. This is the same message <coughs> the WebSocket actor uses when you connect. So when you connect to the service and it goes to the arena and say hey fill me in. How is the arena configured? Size, flower, uh, and then it, when it receives that, it will go to the reader and say, hey, can you assign me a snake, please? And it will do that. Then we simply await this. This is a message result. Um, in this case, I strongly assume with the accept that um, the arena will be around whenever I try to fetch that information. Then I get uh, the game state. I insert this into the context. Context um, you have seen before. Oops, wrong way. Context is this Terra context. I create a default Terra context, which is basically a hash map. Um, if this feels a lot like JavaScript to you, yes, very much. But it works great. It's super fast. Couldn't ask for more. Template context is loaded at start of the server, so all the templates are in memory, super fast, no disk access. Um, we say which one, we give it our hash map context. If there is an error for some reason, we can output this to the user, which is great for debugging. And then you have to look at standard out. But um, yeah, for developing things like that, this is just great. And then we already have uh, a string 
and we just say okay response text HTML with this body ship it so this is all in memory there's a little bit of communication to an actor super fast uh, if we look at the, the stats point two now uh, I don't know how many people are on it yeah I'm really happy with that so now it is time for you to ask questions and I will just put this into the side and yeah if you want to play with more snakes we can absolutely do that we can also increase the size of the arena all right I think I will just increase the number of snakes and also the size of the field there we go Dum -dum -dum. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, you can control the snakes with the arrow keys, uh, WHDS and IJKL. I see some people are uh, hunting or others right now. So, uh, Trimok, I hope I pronounced that correct, asks, uh, what convinced me to use Actix over uh, another ECS, another entity component system. Uh, well, the main reason for me was that I had one actor system for everything. So I don't have um, the actors running on one side of, of the application and then have to bridge into that with the web application. And I just have uh, messaging that are from on the same kind and uh, I don't have to worry about uh, reaching anything in, uh, inside that. Um, I know that the addresses, for instance, in Actix are pretty heavy compared to other entity component systems. So I think um, the city bounds uh, ECS is using 64-bit uh, integers as an identifier for every object. This is much more lightweight than what Actrix address is, which is um, an atomic counter, an atomic channel, and uh, a third thing, uh, which is basically some flags telling the senders of, uh, of these other things, hey, um, this actor has stopped, meaning you cannot send new messages, or this actor has died even. Plus, there is some reference counting involved with that to make that work properly. So, um, yeah, for me, that was the main reason. Having one system for uh, the game and the web server instead of two systems. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, I guess if there are no further questions, we can just continue playing the game. Also, if you have suggestions about the rules, like how many players should be connected to how many snakes and all of that, or how big uh, the, the field should be, then, uh, yeah, please tell me. Because right now it's manual. You're welcome. So, uh, well... Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for uh, attending. And uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, uh, you can uh, message me on Twitter, which I just realized didn't include in the slides. I will also uh, publish the slides soon after. And I hope to see you at Rustfest.